according to the cloud. And let's go live on Facebook. We're going to share it to the SciStarter page. And it's Make It Count Monday, Clean Air, North Carolina. Hi, attendee. Welcome. Uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. Uh, we're also going to have some folks tuning in via Facebook, our friends who don't like to register on Zoom, which is totally fine. So let me just make sure it gets live. Okay, Clean Air North Carolina. Go live. All right, I do believe we are live. So for friends who are watching on Facebook, don't be shy about communicating with us in the comments. We really wanna be responsive to you uh, during tonight's presentation. For those of you watching in Zoom, same goes for you. This is recorded, but don't let that discourage you. Uh, this show is really for you and for what you care about in the world of citizen science. So we're here to engage. I'm gonna put the Facebook link in the chat. Uh, just in, that's the number one question I get with these shows is, will it be available after the fact? Yes, it will. I'm just going to share it to a few Facebook groups so as many people as possible are able to tune in with us, share it to SciStarter Story, share it to the Citizen Science Club. Um, I even think we might have a few international people here tonight because um, they're curious about how North Carolina does it and how they might be able to also pioneer in air quality as well. So Maria, you um, have a lot to teach people tonight. Lots um, of pressure. Yes, no, but it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So <laughs> <laughs> my name is Caroline Nickerson. I'm on the SciStarter team. Um, I come at you live every week at seven o'clock on Monday for Make It Count Monday with um, co-host Deja Perkins. Um, Deja and I explore all sorts of different citizen science topics, and we have special guests like Maria. Um, Maria is joining us today from the nonprofit um, Clean Air Carolina, and she's going to talk about the Air Keepers program. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to quickly show you uh, your one stop for all sorts of citizen science knowledge, scistarter.org forward slash ncsu dash home. You can also just type in scistarter.org forward slash ncsu, and it'll get you where you need to go. Um, but this page and this program are um, because of the NC State University Citizen Science Campus. Um, and when you come to the SciStarter microsite, you're able to access all sorts of good citizen science things. Um, and you're able to be part of the wider Wolfpack community as well. You don't have to be a student or an instructor or related to NCSU in any formal way at all. You could just be a person who wants to access these resources and you're more than welcome to use this microsite. You'll find links to the Citizen Science Club at NC State, really valuable if you are a student there, some stuff from the libraries, a way to get to the main Citizen Science Campus website at ncsu.edu. You'll also find uh, the RSVP for all the other Make It Count Mondays. We're here every single week uh, and it's a lot of fun, so we'd love to see you again soon. Um, you can also find a place where you can make your SciStarter account on this page. I'm logged in, so it's not showing up, but you can check that out. A tutorial that was customized just for you made in partnership with SciStarter and NC State. And then the good stuff, all the different citizen science projects that you can dive into. You can do real scientific research with everything from investigating safe drinking water to making your own sourdough for science, uh, to studying the biodiversity around you, to speeding up Alzheimer's research by playing an online game, and by uh, learning about the air and why air quality matters. You can even sign up for the Air Keepers mailing list um, as part of tonight's um, event. But each one of these projects has been featured on a different Make It Count Monday. So you can explore past recordings of this and dive in a little bit and learn from these evergreen resources. We also have a number of different lists, some of which are matched to project, um, to courses offered at NC State. Um, so citizen science is really in the classroom and all around North Carolina. So that's the NCSU page. I hope you all use it and it's a good resource for you. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen because um, when we were thinking about icebreakers for our special guest, Maria, um, we thought, what's, what better way to break the ice about air quality than to ask Maria what her favorite thing about breathing is? Uh, Maria, <laughs> can you tell us? Um, I like to breathe to stay alive, and I think most of you will agree with me. <laughs> Deja, do you agree? Uh, I would 
would agree. My favorite thing about breathing is the fact that it keeps me alive. But um, I would say my favorite thing about air is that I was I was always fascinated that air I always thought like air comes from trees it's not exactly how it works but it's still like a cool process if we think about it definitely yeah I think it's something that we don't think about very often and maybe we take it for granted most yeah. definitely for sure um Caroline what about you I mean yeah I was just I think that's such a good point that um Maria you and Maria just made about how we don't really think about it I only think about it when it's bad, um, when the air quality is poor. Um, when it, I, I spent a semester in Beijing, China, and some days it would be hard to see across the street and there where it's actually visible, it's something you, you do think about. Um, or when you're up in the mountains and you can't really breathe, you start thinking about, wow, you know, the air down at lower elevations is quite nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, air is such an important thing. And I was really excited about tonight's program because Maria, you can educate us about this everyday thing that's automatic, but so important. Yeah, yeah. Be happy to, to try to give some insights into that. So Maria, I guess our second icebreaker or, you know, inquiring minds want to know question. And I'm, I'm curious, did you ever imagine that you would be doing this as, you know, 10 year old little you? <laughs> no, and not even for a second. <laughs> So no. what did 10 year old Maria think that she was going to be doing as a Yeah, uh, 10 year old Maria was obsessed with Dear America books and learning about history and science. So 10 year old Maria, I actually have this written down from like a fifth grade, like memories and dreams ceremony. I wanted to be an Egyptologist. I really liked all things Egypt um, and history and turned out anthropology, which was my major in undergrad. Um, and after that, I worked in the citizen science space for a couple of years at the Smithsonian. Um, and then I decided I wanted to pursue that further. And I went to graduate school at North Carolina State University with Deja. And I worked with Caroline and Karen um, quite closely. So here I am now. <laughs> awesome. Yay. We're so glad to have you on the show this Yay. week. Um, Happy to be here. I'm curious, what was it about citizen science that made you want to stick with it, you know, moving, making the transition from anthropology to citizen science, and then, you know, thinking that citizen science was where you wanted to stay. Yeah, um, this is going to sound super cheesy, but it's very honest and from the heart. Um, I wanted to work with people. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And I thought that citizen science was a pretty cool way to do that. It combines a lot of my favorite things, which is science and nature and environment and animals and people. Um, and so citizen science seemed like a really great way to combine all of those things in a really meaningful and impactful way. I don't think that's cheesy at all. I actually think <laughs> that's great. No, I, I'm, I'm being honest here because at the at the core of it all, you know, citizen science is people powered science. People are at the core of it and people are so important, are such an integral part um, of science, in, whether it's citizen science or just science science <laughs> I guess yeah, like you can't... Science that's done by researchers it's, it's super important that we keep people um kind of at the center of it so the fact that you care about people and that's what motivated you to stay in this realm is amazing yeah we can't have any kind of science without communication and talking about it otherwise who does it impact and who does it affect and some types of science like air quality research directly affect people yes definitely for sure so I guess, I guess my next inquiring minds want to know question would be, what's the most surprising fun fact about air that you learned um, once you stepped into this role? Um, everything, honest. I don't have a, a good like fun fact because everything that I've learned since stepping into this role has been new information and um, you know, I didn't study air quality in any of my life up until this point, but I think that that's heartening for the volunteers who, the air keepers who we engage, um, because you don't have to be an air quality expert to understand why air quality, good air quality is good or important. Um, I think I've been most surprised to learn about the policies and regulations that we have in place. I've never, you know, had a position that's quite so integral and in, integrated in with policy, um, but that's a big part of what we do. And yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about the, the relationship between science and policy. 
for sure, for sure. And I actually think that's a great segue um, for you to tell us a little bit more about the project and about Clean Air Carolina. Sure, I'd be delighted to. I'm going to share my screen. I have a couple of slides, but uh, Deja, I'll let you stop me whenever is appropriate. Otherwise, I will keep talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let me get this going here. Okay. Um, so thank you again for having me. I'm so happy to be here and to talk about um, Clean Air Carolina and the Air Keepers program. Um, so I work for an organization called Clean Air Carolina. We are a small nonprofit in based out of Charlotte and Durham, we have two offices. Um, and I work primarily on the Air Keepers program, which is the citizen science branch of our organization. But we also have a number of, uh, of of programs. Um, one of them is called Medical Advocates for Healthy Air, and that is a program where we engage doctors and other healthcare professionals and teach them how to uh, advocate for better air quality policies in North Carolina. Um, we have the Charlotte Mecklenburg Climate Leaders, in which we train residents of the Charlotte in the Charlotte Mecklenburg County area um, to again advocate for healthy air and air quality. Um, we also have uh, a policy and a legal advocacy program. Um, and largely that is the center, the central force of our organization because policy and legal advocacy are the keys to improving air quality and addressing the climate crisis. So we kind of have this three prong program approach and mine is the science piece. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit first about why air pollution is so important and why I'm talking about it in general and why you know our organization exists and why we're talking about it. And that's because air quality air pollution is it has a huge impact on everyone's health. Air pollution can affect people at any age and it can have lifelong impacts. And so you know I, I made this comment earlier during the introduction that you know I like breathing for air. Um, and, and that's very true. And when you think about other kinds of pollution, like for example, water quality pollution, have, if you think about if you've ever been to the beach or a lake or something like that, and there's a sign that says, you know, don't go into the water, there's, you know, a blue green algae bloom or something like that. That's a pretty easy thing to do to, to mitigate your exposure to that pollutant. But air is quite different. You can't just stop breathing. Um, and so, air quality has a direct impact on our health, but it also can exacerbate other health concerns. So things like asthma and COPD and other heart and lung problems can be caused or made, made worsened by air quality, by poor air quality. And so we wanna make sure that in the process of setting up the monitors, we do them either near the sources of pollution like factories or processing plants, things like that, or near areas where people live. So you know, thinking about vulnerable people like kids who breathe at much higher rates than adults do. So thinking of schools or daycare centers. Um, I think that's something that's especially um, relevant right now is the COVID-19 pandemic and people are thinking a lot about their respiratory health and their exposure to things. So um, masks actually will help quite a bit with reducing exposure to air quality pollution. Um, so the other piece that I'll mention about this is that minority, minority groups such as African Americans and Native Americans are a lot more likely to suffer from health disparities in general. Um, and that also makes them susceptible to adverse impacts of air pollution exposure and climate change. And so that's you know due to a lot of things, a lot of financial and historic factors, um, but there are minority groups that have less less like that are less likely to have access to healthcare and well insulated housing and air conditioning and in general experience higher love higher rates of disease such as asthma and blood pressure and they're exacerbated by air pollution. And so thinking about um, the top leading causes of death in North Carolina, um, that's you know air quality directly impacts four out of the five of them. Um, and so the number of deaths caused, caused by all four of these are increasing. Um, and so air pollution today is the largest contributor to premature death. And this data comes from a number of different sources. Um, but back in 2016, air pollution was the contributor to 4.3 million premature deaths, which is quite a bit. So this is a serious problem. Air pollution impacts are wide ranging. Um, and not only does it impact your health directly, but it'll make other ailments worse. worse. Um, and so here are some uh, statistics about asthma in North Carolina. And you'll see that um, the asthma prevalence among children in North Carolina stays at about 18%, which is one in five children. This is 
you know, it's a, a staggering statistic and we want to be able to do something about that. And so this is why we are collecting information about air quality. Um, and in thinking about where air quality is bad, a lot of people traditionally think about obvious areas like industrial areas that produce a lot of smoke and busy roads that emit a lot of vehicle exhaust and urban areas that typically contain higher ratios of particulate matter. Um, and we find that, uh, you know, busy, busy roads are in fact the number one contributor to air pollution. And when you mix roads with urban areas, which typically have a mixture of industrial areas and heavy roads, they produce their own kind of, you know, urban heat island effect. Um, and as we know, pollution doesn't affect all people equally. Um, there's a fancy term that you might have heard of called social determinants of health, which means you're more likely to be impacted by air quality if you, issues if there's other health impacts that you're already wrestling with, like CP, COPD or asthma. Um, although having said this, there are a lot of areas where air pollution exists that you might not expect it to. Um, so contrary to popular belief, the effects of air pollution are not limited to urban environments. There's no you know, particular spot where air says, no, we're not gonna go past here. That's the problem with air and air quality regulations is that air goes where it wants to go. Um, there's no state or you know, human invented lines that will change that. Um, and so you might have air quality that is poor, but the source might be quite far away from you. Um, and so airborne concentrations of particulate matter can be generated from things like agricultural fields and shipping practices um, and might make the air around you worse, even if it's far away. Um, and it's true that air pollution gets worse in the summer, but it doesn't just go away when summer is over. The weather can have significant impact on air quality in all seasons. And I actually have a really cool example from a couple of weeks ago um, that I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Um, so yeah, uh, wind speed and air turbulence can affect how pollutants disperse and spread out in an area. There's this common saying, I think, in chemistry research that you might have heard of. It's the solution to pollution is dilution, which is true, but only to a certain extent. And if you have really high emission rates in a particular area that's going to have an impact on people. The other piece that I want to bring into this is climate change and climate impacts on air quality. Um, North Carolina in particular is getting hotter, drier, and wetter all at the same time. Um, last century we used to see about a month of days with a high of 90 degrees or more. Later this century, we can expect half of the year to be in the 90s. Um, we see increased droughts, which makes us more susceptible to wildfires. I'm sure some of you living in the state have you know, noticed maybe some, some smells or some murkiness in the air recently. Um, wildfires can cause, a, and those are from planned burns, but still fires can cause a spike in air pollution, particular, particularly from particulate matter, which is the specific kind of air quality measure that we, that we at Cleaner Carolina track. Um, and uh, air pollution changes cloud and weather development in the atmosphere, which contributes to increases in droughts and flooding. So we're already seeing a 27% increase in heavy precipitation. Um, and when we get huge downpours during a drought, the earth can't absorb the water. So we end up with flooding, which in turn leads to all kinds of other problems. Um, and so maybe a, a, a more recent example, if anyone was living in the state just a couple of years ago, you know, we had, um, the pollen copolips, pollen pocalypse, pollen pocalypse in Durham uh, in the spring of 2019. Um, so we saw a drastic increase of pollen in the air, enough that it became a yellow haze all over the city. And so these are weather and climate events like this are only expected to become more and more common um, as climate change worsens, which creates a severe health risk for a lot of people. Um, rising temperatures also lead to increased incidence of heat-related illnesses, especially amongst you know, vulnerable people like children, elderly, outdoor workers, and athletes who train or compete outdoors. Um, shorter winters in, in, in the wintertime between December and March will uh, have an impact on infectious disease vectors such as ticks and mosquitoes. This can, can lead to an increase in vector-borne illnesses such as Rocky Mart Mountain Spotted Fever, West Nile virus, and Zika. Um, and so, and, and uh, this has an impact on sea level rise, which can affect jobs based on the environments like farming and fishing and outdoor tourism, which can cause a lot of anxiety and fear. And so I think earlier when you asked, did you expect to learn as much as you did about air quality? No, I didn't, but it's so integrated into every other natural system that we have um, that I think it's important 
to, to think about the multiple pieces and the impacts that we can have on each of the pieces. Um, when I say we, I mean us as citizens. And the last kind of two things I'll, I'll talk about before I pause and, and uh, let Deja talk to me again is um, thinking about what the air pollutants are. And so when we talk about air pollution, you know, you might think of particulate matter, you might think of pollen, you might think of gases, but this is a kind of a nice chart that directs what I'm going to be talking about in the next couple, over the next, you know, 40 minutes or however long I have with you. Um, in general, air pollutants are any substance that's introduced to the atmosphere that has lasting damage on living things and the environment. Some of these things are pollutants. Uh, some of these are, so, sorry, some of these pollutants are gases and others are particles. And I'm sure that many of you think that smoking is harmful. And we know that smoking causes a lot of health problems. And that's a type of air pollution. So all air pollution is bad, but most of it don't realize it. Most of us don't realize it. There's also, you know, a section of these like sulfur dioxide, for example, that are naturally occurring. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the difference between naturally occurring and human exacerbated um, air quality emissions and pollution. Um, and in general, over the course of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about this section down here, which is called PM 2.5, PM 10. Um, and Particulate matter are particles. They can be solid or liquid, and they're kind of, um, they're suspended in the air. So a fine particle can include hazardous heavy metals, air toxics, very, very air toxics, and various types of carbon. And some sources of this include um, fossil fuel combustion, dust from agriculture and construction, burning of wood and other waste, agricultural animal waste, um, and, you know, typical wear from roads and tires and brakes. And when I say PM 2.5, that 2.5 refers to a size, and that means it's 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller. And you'll see here that the human hair is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. PM 2.5 is much, much smaller. It's a much smaller chunk of, of that hair. And this is to the size that the lungs cannot remove it, um, but these invisible particles will pass, will can reach deep into your lungs and cause inflammation and pass into your bloodstream and you know cause oxidative stress and imbalances in your nervous system. And um, studies have shown that it can cross the blood the blood brain barrier once it reaches the bloodstream and cause all kinds of wreak all kinds of havoc on on the human system. Um, and so I will I will pause there. Um, and and let Deja talk to me for a second. Wow, Maria, I had no idea. I mean, I knew air quality and issues with air pollution were a big deal, but I had no idea just how much it impacts us. I had no idea um, that, you know, it was connected even to climate change. And, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's a, it's a little bit of a scary thought when you think about just how small um, PM uh, 2.5 is. Uh, with this great chart that you have for us here. And you said it doesn't get removed. It cannot pass through or come it, out of our lungs. It, it, so it can pass through into your lungs and it's not like a, a, a get it out kind of a thing. It's so the issue I think with when it comes to PM 2.5 is, is exposure. You know, all of us are gonna inhale some amount of PM 2.5, um, but whether it's a low amount over the course of your life is hugely different from living next door to an industrial facility where you're inhaling that every single day or, you know, working next to a lot of machinery um, where you're inhaling that on a, on a really regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, you know, a difference between adults who have, you know, some partial exposure to that versus children who breathe a lot more and, and in general are developing their lungs still. So I think that there's a couple of other factors that go into it before we all panic. <laughs> um, obviously, PM 2.5 is not great for anybody, but it's, it's, it's worse for certain groups of people. And that's kind of the, the groups that we're hoping to reach with our work. Yeah, wow. You know, I was thinking um, when you were showing us that, um, that graphic um, with the kids versus the adults, and um, I saw, you know, asthma, in mm -hmm. on, on so many of those um, categories. And I was just thinking, you know, as a kid in my community, like I grew up in Chicago and we were, I would say about like a, a 10 minute drive from a landfill and a factory. And, you know, the only 
thing that I knew about it at the time as a kid was that my mom would always say oh it smells like when we would pass by it but asthma was something that was so common in you know all the school kids you know a lot of my classmates both of my siblings have it so it was just like a common thing it was just like oh yeah like I have asthma and you know it's it's almost like everybody gets a little asthma pump as a little like keepsake you know because it became normalized, but it really, it shouldn't be, right? Like, it's a huge, huge issue. So I'm just sitting here in awe. My mind is blown. And thank you for giving us a lot to think about so far. <laughs> yeah, and, it, it, and like I said at the beginning, all of these are ultimately human issues. They're human responses to these things. Um, and so part of, I think, the, the mitigating the scariness of air quality pollution is knowing where it is and how bad it is and who is responsible and maybe taking some actions to, to make it better. Yeah. So, um, Caroline, unless you have a question, Maria, I think it'd be great if you could show us exactly how I would be delighted to. Let's dive in. Yeah. And also, um, I don't have any questions yet. I'm in awe like Deja is. It's a lot to think about. Um, but for folks watching on Facebook and for our friends in Zoom with us, don't be shy about questions, but let's get going with some demos. Sure. Yeah. So I will talk about kind of how we developed the network of sensors that we have um, and what we use to measure air quality. And, and then what do we do with that information? I'll provide an example. So um, the citizen science program at Clean Air Carolina, um, it started as a working with a specific group of people. We work with the historic West End in Charlotte. Um, and so let me back up a little bit. Um, we work with a few types of monitors that we distribute to air keepers. Um, one of them is called the air beam, which is at the top right. And it's actually sitting right here next to me. Um, it looks like a little ghost. Um, and this will, it's good for um, an instant reading of PM 2.5. It connects to a tablet and you can see PM 2.5 levels change as you move around. And this is great for short-term sampling efforts or if you want to sample your personal exposure as you're you know, walking around. The negative about it is that it doesn't have a very long battery life. It's only going to give you a couple of hours. So it's not like you can wear it on your person at all times and, you know, keep track of things during the day. But if you have, you know, a suspicious, you know, parking lot or whatever or area that you're thinking about in the space where you live, this is a great tool to use. Um, the sensor that our air keepers typically use is called the Purple Air Sensors, which is a com Purple Air is a company that make makes these air quality monitors. And um, one of these is pictured on the bottom right of the screen with the number one. Um, so this unit is connected to Wi-Fi and power, and it's able to continuously measure how much PM 2.5 is in a particular area. And these units need constant Wi-Fi and power in order to update to the purpleair.com map, which I'll show in a, in a moment. Um, each of these units costs about $200, which is pretty low cost when compared to other air quality monitors, which can run up to you know, thousands of dollars. Um, and so Purple Air is really effective and it's a sustainable way to get measurements across neighborhoods or ro localized areas over a period of time. And so Purple Air will update about every 10 minutes or so. Um, but the cool thing about it is that when you go to purpleair.com, you can see other Purple Air monitors in the state and around you. So, you know, it might, it might be the case that your next door neighbor has a Purple Air monitor um, and your air quality monitor readings will be quite similar. So um, here is what a map of the Purple Air Network looks like. I've zoomed in on North Carolina. And this is a screenshot that I took last week in the morning. You'll notice that it's red. Um, red is not good. Uh, the, the scale, which I'll, I'll show in, in a couple more slides, it goes from green to yellow to orange to red. And I was very surprised uh, when I opened up the map that morning and I saw this reading. Um, and you can, I mean, you can see that it's across the whole state. So I was suspicious because uh, this doesn't, didn't seem like a localized thing. Um, my first instinct was, you know, maybe there's a large fire or something in Georgia that blew up particulate matter into the state of North Carolina. Um, you know, I started thinking about what is the source of this? What is happening? It turned out that this was a regional weather effect that happens quite frequently in, uh, you know, across the mid-Atlantic and the eastern seaboard about this time of year in March when um, the weather is really cold in, at night and in the early morning and then it warms out throughout the day. So this was the following day, just a couple of hours later, so about noon. Um, nice weather creates something called temperature inversions, which can track um, 
which means that you can track particulate matter pollution on the surface of the earth. And so this is a morning phenomenon. It happens in winter months. Um, if you think about how cold and hot like to behave, just the temperatures in general, um, warm likes to travel up, cold likes to stay down low. And so what happened on these couple of mornings last week was that cold air was kind of trapped below the warm air. And it was a really, really stable system. The air near the, near the surface of the earth was quite chilled from the overnight. Um, folks were using, you know, probably wood burning stoves, um, any of the pollution emissions that had occurred overnight from cars and regular, you know, just typical emissions had stayed near the surface. And we see these, these phenomena happen in places like Beijing, which Caroline talked about earlier, and places like, um, for example, Salt Lake City or Mexico City. Um, these cities are, you know, up against mountains. And so these temperature inversions happen quite frequently then. They happen a little bit, bit less frequently in North Carolina and in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, but rapid cooling overnight, rapid warming during the day. Um, and so by midday, the ground had heated up and the system kind of destabilized and that, that cap, that, that lid of cold, of warm air that was on top of the cold air kind of dissipated. And so things like this, and uh, examples like this can have an impact on our personal choices. And maybe knowing this information for someone who is asthmatic or has COPD would have helped inform their choices or would have helped inform anyone's choice to you know, maybe go on the run in the morning or whether you drive with the windows down. So knowledge about the pollution level near you in real time, I think is a really effective way to make personal decisions for, for, for that moment in time. And so I started talking about the historic West End that we started this project with. Um, the Air Keepers program grew out of the historic West End. Um, it started about four years ago, and we chose to start it there because, first of all, Cleaner Carolina is based in, in Charlotte, so that was a reason, but also because neighborhoods in the historic West End um, we're in an area that were disproportionately impacted by air quality pollution. And we monitored air quality there for three years with portable air sensors and compared the um, historically lower income redlined West End area, which also you can see is at the intersection of these interstates 77 and 85 going across the map on the, on the right of the screen. And uh, that also means that there's more businesses there that need air quality permits. Um, and so we compared this historic West End area to areas in the southern part of the city that are historically more affluent. And this gets into something called environmental justice, which is at the crux of our work, really. Um, here's another map which shows the interstates and the roadways that cut through the historic West End. The area in the green is South Charlotte, which is a wealthier part of the city. Um, the red and the yellow indicates areas of the city where redlining was done to limit public and private investment, which affected property and land values. The two orange squares, one here and one here, um, indicate the two EPA monitoring sites of fine particle pollution. So as you can see, here's the two sites, the city is much larger than that. Um, and air quality is pretty localized. So that was not gonna be a sustainable or effective way to measure air quality over the whole city. The circles represent facilities that pollute the air, which could be things like gas stations, um, or it could be an industrial source of pollution. And so when we think about environmental justice, we're talking about a group of people who bear a disproportionate affair, a share of negative environmental impacts that result from operations or policies. And so this is something that we wanted to, to, to work against it in the historic West End. And this is something that we wanna to continue to do in across all of North Carolina. And so what we did there um, was we helped develop a report to county commissioners and a new EPA monitor is now located in the historic West End. We're also developing plans to set up a historic West End green district by which I mean um, things, other things to improve air quality, things like planting trees along the highway, installing green walls and other green infrastructure in public spaces, ideally near bus stops, and advocating for more electric vehicles and clean transit and construction in the historic West End. And so I think I would like to pause there for another moment um, before I get into the Clean Air Act and some of the other pollutants um, that, we, that we talk about when we talk about air quality pollution. Yeah, so I'm, I have a couple of questions, actually. Of and I guess the first one is related to 
what you just shared with us about I guess it, it seems like a, you all took this project from beginning to end with even, you know, having some actionable change. So I'm curious, what is what was that pro- process like? Like, how did you ensure with this work that, you know, you all were working with the community and not, you know, not taking from the community and allowing them to, you know, be their own advocates for, you know, their health and, and about the air in their neighborhoods? Yeah, yeah, that's a a great point, Deja. Thank you. Um, I think part of what we did was we approached the community from the get go and talked about what they wanted to get out of this. And so at the crux of all of this, it was supporting them and their endeavors and not, you know, trying to save anybody. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to support. Um, And you'll, you know, you've probably seen a couple of faces crop up in the photos that I've shared. And that's because those are our neighborhood partners. Um, and those are, you know, leaders of their neighborhood associations, and there are the folks, the point people that we worked with to to do this. So the, there was a mutual commitment to the mission at hand, which was improving the air quality and what could Clean Air Carolina do in order to support that. And so we did that through a number of ways. You know, there was, um, you know financial incentives to them. We know we paid them small um, uh, sums of, 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 uh, of money to, to kind of help support their work and help support their leadership on these efforts. Um, and so, yeah, there, I can tell you the names of, of, the, of the three um, neighborhood leaders that, that we worked with really closely. And that was, I think, and it continues to be a driving force in our work is to keep the, the, issues that that we are interested in and that the community in, is interested in at the center of of our work. Yeah, that was that's great. Um, we need we almost need a model, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that other projects can follow in in you all's footsteps. Um, and I guess my next question that I have is how exactly how exactly do you measure air? Like, how exactly does the 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 um, monitor work? Sure. So let me go back to the slide. Um, so down here at the bottom right is this purple air monitor that we have going on here, um, and this white box is the the monitoring source. It's the the monitor itself. So there's a small fan that will suck in air to the bottom of this, um, and then there's a laser in that in that box that kind of goes from one end of the box to the other. And when the air is sucked in, it passes through that laser and that laser can count how many particles um, get in the way of the light beam before it reaches the other side. So the more kind of uh, um, interference it has, the higher the PM 2.5 reading is. And you know, this isn't the, the highest tech. It's not the, the most sensitive monitor that exists of all time, but it is the most cost-effective monitor that gets really cl- a really close reading um, of what the actual PM 2.5 levels are. And so uh, it'll need to be connected to power at all times and Wi-Fi at all times, which are kind of two pretty large infrastructure issues when you're talking about you know building a network across the whole state of North Carolina. Um, but that's in general how it works. And then the based on Wi-Fi, the, the monitor will send readings to the website about every 10 minutes or so. Um, it's not a huge Wi-Fi, you know, suck or anything like that. It's not, it's, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth. Um, it just needs to be close by the router. So I have one hanging outside of my house. So um, since it needs to be connected to power and Wi-Fi at all times, you know, we get a lot of hurricanes here, you know, they're going to get even more, intense you know as time goes on and extreme so what happens you know when people who are more close to the coast have these monitors and the storms knock them out what uh what do you all do yeah that's a (laughs) it's a great question um essentially the monitors go offline and we don't get measurements for that point in time which is a a limitation of this particular kind of air monitor. Um, And that may be a situation where the air beam, which is uh, more offline, um, will be be of better use. In general, once the monitors go offline, as soon as power is restored, it'll try to reconnect to your Wi-Fi network immediately. So my power has gone out a couple of times over the last couple of weeks since I've had the monitor up. um, And it'll just reconnect right back to the Wi-Fi network when it's able to. It's a 
it's a it's a pretty nifty device. <laughs> So are there any limitations for people who live in more rural areas, you know, um, who may not have as many, I know like there are more, what, cell towers or whatever, however we get our Wi-Fi, I don't know, mm -hmm. I'm not a person, but <laughs> I'm sure there are more towers in urban spaces and rural spaces, so what happens then when you may not have, you know, like super great internet connectivity or things like, does that mess up the data that you all are collecting? Um, well, eligible for monitors yeah yeah that's a great question in terms of you know thinking about where we want to place monitors and kind of balancing that with the infrastructure challenges that we have um, and so one of the things that we've thought a lot about is um, places that might have a little bit more reliable infrastructure like schools or public libraries for example um, and and so i think that that's a, you know a, a, a great question, but it's also thinking about um, whether you want to place monitors, you know, the balancing act of placing monitors near emission sources versus near vulnerable populations. And so it becomes this like, well, what are you, what are you most interested in? In all likelihood, when we work with communities who have concerns about the air quality near them, it's because they live near the source and they themselves are concerned about their own health. Um, and so this could be, you know, a processing plant that's a little bit too close to a particular neighborhood and they don't want it there. Um, or it could be, you know, there's a train tracks that pass behind a school or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's thinking of those kinds of questions and the core of it isn't, you know, it, it's, it's why do you want to measure where you want to measure, right? Um, so it gets into, into what are communities interested in? So I'm curious um, who, you know, aside from your organization and, you know, the communities that are participating in the project, who else uses the data? What is, you know, what, what is the data used for um, that people are collecting? Yeah, um, so we have effectively used Purple Air recorded data to um, present comment to North Carolina based um, policy organizations. There's also, you know, Clean Air Carolina doesn't own Purple Air. Purple Air is its own kind of company. Um, and there, anybody can purchase a Purple Air monitor. Anybody listening in now can purchase a Purple Air monitor on their own. Um, and so one of the benefits to doing that is if you have concerns about the air quality in your area, even if you don't live in North Carolina, you can learn more about it. And so one of the um, places that we've seen a lot of a lot of more purple air monitors go up is in California where there's been a lot of wildfires and folks concerned about the air quality around them um, during the fire season, which is getting longer and longer there. So um, yeah, lots of possibilities there. And um, I have a quick question. I know we have some more material to get through with um stuff for educators because we have a pretty big educator audience that tunes into this and the science behind it. But I wanted to ask because um, also I saw that uh, Dr. Karen Cooper chimed in, in the chat that she has a purple air monitor on her porch, which I love. I love that so much. <laughs> um, are there any pro ways to contribute to air quality citizen science if like maybe you don't have the means to get the equipment? Are there any projects you can do with just your eyes? Um, so there are a couple of projects that I know of, and if folks have other ideas, they can please feel free to chime in and let me know because I'm also new to this air quality monitoring space. Um, uh, there's, you know, a project called Smell My City, which is app based, and it all you need is your nose and your phone. Um, and it was piloted in Pittsburgh, which, you know, has a lot of these kinds of emission sources that are not great smelling. Um, and so they were effective, they were able to um, effectively collect data, I believe, about um, sulfur dioxide, um, which kind of smells like rotten eggs, um, and and uh, pass some regulations about that in the city. And so, yeah, so smell your city is one that I know of, <laughs> but please feel free to let me know about others that are uh, low equipment uh, requirements. Oh no, Deja doesn't have a sense of smell. <laughs> uh, you could probably still do eyewitness pollution. Karen, put that one in the chat. Go look that one up. There's a whole wide world of citizen science out there. I really love it. Yeah. 
Great. Well, maybe uh, Maria, we'll let you get back to the, the more science behind it portion if you're ready. Sure. Yes, I would. I guess. And I would, what I would like to talk about next is um, the Clean Air Act, which is kind of the getting into the more regulatory space of our work. Um, so the Clean Air legislation was passed in 1970, and these are the six most prevalent um, pollutants, and they have the highest cause of health outcome issues in the United States. And so these six large contributors were added to this act um, and they are meant to be monitored and added to regulatory compliance concerns. And so we inhale a lot of things. If everybody wants to take a deep breath with me right now, everybody just inhaled oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and a bunch of other stuff. And so um, here are some of them. Uh, so the, EPA national ambient air quality standards for these six pollutants are called criteria pollutants, which are shown here. Um, and these six substances are particulate matter, which I've talked a little bit about, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, lead, and ground level ozone. And they're all monitored in our air. Um, and I'd like to really briefly go over all of them. I think we, we, can, we can fit it in. Um, and so uh, let's see, lead very quickly is uh, for the most part, we don't have to deal with lead in the atmosphere. It's quite poisonous. Um, and the problem with lead is that as a material, it's been really useful in pipes and in helping paint not to corrode or stay on the side of buildings. Um, lead can also be added to gasoline to prevent backfiring that you would get in gasoline engines. And so if you own a car and or fill up your tank ever, you'll, you'll see, you know, unleaded gasoline. Um, and so luckily it's not in the air a whole lot anymore. And we still have to worry about it in terms of paint and pipes, but for now lead in the air has been decreased dramatically thanks to the Clean Air Act. And so the places where you still might see it are planes with propellers. Um, so if you, you know, are into flying or have a pilot's license, you might be getting some lead exposure there, but in general, the rest of us, not a whole lot. Um, carbon monoxide, hopefully all of you have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Um, these days, carbon monoxide is mostly an indoor pollution issue and it can cause immediate health concerns for individuals. Um, and the way that it works is it fills up your red blood cells in a way that oxygen can't and it replaces those receptors, which is why, you know, in the wintertime, a lot of the times you hear about, you know, carbon monoxide poisoning or, you know, um, anything, it, it results from anything that is burning inside. And so for the most part, um, that's things like uh, heat sources. So if you have a um, fireplace that isn't ventilating very well, that's where you can get that. Some other sources outside are small engines. So think about weed whackers and lawn mowers, campfires. So it's a good idea to keep a safe distance away from any kind of burning fuel. Um, we haven't seen carbon monoxide as a regional air pollutant nearly as much as some of the others. Sulfur dioxide, which I've already mentioned quite a little bit, um, is uh, it, it comes from the earth naturally. And so we can get it in the atmosphere when we burn it. So most of sulfur dioxide will come from diesel fuel and coal power plants. Um, coal has a really high sulfur concentration. Um, and recently there's been a lot of regulations put onto power plants that add sulfur scrubbers that reduce the amount of sulfur that gets into the atmosphere during a normal operation of a coal, coal plant, which is great when you think about reducing things like acid rain. Um, and so, we do not want to, to create more acid rain. So this is one of the things that help that helps uh, reduce it. And so you might expect to see sulfur dioxide naturally from volcanoes um, and, and, and things like that. Um, the other, the last two things that I'll talk about is nitrogen dioxide, which is similar to sulfur dioxide. And we again, produce it by coal burning. Um, it's a big part of diesel fuel emissions and uh, nitrogen dioxide on the map on the right is also where you might have seen some recent news articles about air pollution reductions during pandemic quarantines. So countries like Italy or China who shut down their roads and industrial activity, they saw a huge drop in NO2. And for the most part, you'll find nitrogen dioxide in parts of the world where there are more diesel engines than in the United States, where we mostly have gasoline cars. Um, and the last uh, of these six that I'll talk about is ground level ozone. And so we've all heard about uh, you know, the hole in the ozone layer, but this is quite different. And so when it's lower in the atmosphere, it's a pollutant. And 
basically it causes kind of a sunburn inside of a person's lungs. And it exacerbates a lot of the same health issues like COPD and asthma. And uh, so ozone is typically a regional air pollutant, um, but it's tricky to track and trace. And so this is again, something that we're interested in tracking. Um, and, and these emissions can come from things like coal combustion, vehicles, exhaust, industrial facilities. And during the day as the temperature rises and traffic and industrial emissions build up, ozone levels grow. And because of this, the worst time for exposure is you know, in the late afternoon, three to 7 p.m., around the same time that we're all getting out of school or work and going outside for our evening activities or you know, playing outside or what have you. And so it's important to track ozone as well as um, particulate matter, which I've you know, talked quite a bit about. And so all of these things together, these six key indicators of air quality result in measures of air quality. So it results in something called the air quality index. And each of these six criteria pollutants has a level of health safety attached to it, which is known as the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And it's taken years and years of research for scientists to come up with these standards based on research and um, on the effect of each separate pollutant on the human body, which involves an exposure assessment and a population assessment. And so it can be really tricky to look at each one of those um, emissions and be able to determine, you know, air quality is good or bad. And so what we can do is um, look at this air quality index um, to synthesize it together. And so instead of thinking about the concentrations of each pollutant, instead, uh, you know, there's kind of this sliding scale that corresponds to your overall health concerns based on pollutants together. And, you know, again, like I said, there's been a lot of research that has gone into these conversion rates, which is um, a little bit above my pay grade, but it's been color coded for simplicity. And so, like I said, green is the safest that it could be. That's the lowest level. It goes all the way down to zero, which means there's no air pollution in the atmosphere, all the way up to 50. Um, and that's to say that this is the lowest air pollution um, band of air pollution, and this is the healthiest range. And you know, there's never going to be a perfect environment. There will always be a small amount of each of these substances, and you know, small amounts of these over the course of your life can have an impact on your life. But green shouldn't deter folks from going outside and enjoying their day. Yellow is where you get some some sensitivity. Um, for folks with health conditions such as asthma, COPD, and you can feel it in your lungs. But for the most part, part people won't be affected between in, in this yellow range. Orange is where you get an air quality alert, like on your phone. Um, and uh, on, on a regional level, level, your local meteorologist might mention it. You might see this pop up. The range starts at 100, and it means that a broader, broader part of the population might feel these impacts. And above that, we have these red, purple, and maroon, which are way less common in the United States, but still exist in industrial parts. Um, and these are really high levels of air pollution um, in industrial areas and close to roadways, and they can have really large health impacts. And so the things that I wanna say about the air quality index are is that it's not in real time. And um, people who want to get into air quality monitoring with their low cost sensors, it's easy to determine green, yellow, orange, red. And it's easy to understand that as air quality, as air pollution goes up, so does the air quality index, but that doesn't always happen immediately. And so, uh, you know, on mornings like last week with the example I showed across North Carolina, um, that that's immediate uh, air quality information that people can act upon that might not have been reflected in the AQI that day. And so, that's just to say that it may take some time for the AQI to catch up with what's actually going on. And that's not to cause an undue amount of worry or confusion around what it is. It's just multiple pollutions, most, multiple pollutants at a time that it's measuring. Um, and so it's, it's meant to be kind of this way for people to, it's, it's a tool for understanding the real questions that we want answered, the actionable questions. Is it safe to go outside given that I have these health concerns? Is it safe to have outdoor recess or what have you? And so um, I will say that uh, my recommendation is to keep in, keep in touch with the AQI, take a look at purple air maps. If you're interested in air quality monitoring, obtain a monitor um, and, and keep in mind those regional weather patterns because they can have a really big impact on air quality that might not actually, you know, be as bad as you think it might be. Um, and so thinking about um, 
a couple of things that are coming up for Clean Air Carolina. We're currently evaluating our existing network. So at the moment, we're not looking for any more volunteers. Um, we're evaluating our, our network and seeing kind of where the gaps are. We've sent out you know, close to 150 monitors at this point, and we wanna really hone in on the areas where we might not have as many monitors as we want to have. And so we're working with an external contractor to do this, and hopefully soon we can determine some existing gaps in our sensor network and have a really policy and health informed focus for our future directions and future monitoring efforts. And part of this is thinking thoughtfully about how we can expand our presence in schools. And you know, given the pandemic and given some recent staff changes, we want to engage teachers and we want to make sure to do this in a mutually beneficial way um, across the state. And so our vision for the future is to ultimately ensure air quality for all North Carolinians through education and by working with our partners to reduce source pollution. And some more resources that I'll provide um, are so you know I'm by no means an air quality expert I've said this a couple of times here but I'm a program manager at a small air quality nonprofit and so I wanted to share some of these resources so EPA measures a lot of air pollution across the United States and you can find loads of information and data on their website um, for those of you in North Carolina um, the Department of Env Environmental Quality DEQ has a great amount of resources for K-12 teachers a lot of lesson plans and things like that um, the CDC has a great number of descriptions of health impacts of air pollutants on human health. Um, and then, oh, my, my WHO logo is missing. Oops, sorry about that. Um, American Lung Association puts out scorecards for states and counties and countries, so you can learn more there. Um, and here I'll just, I'll just uh, plug a couple of things that are coming up. So uh, there we have a Cleaner Carolina conference that's coming up on April 6th and 7th called Breathe. Um, and if you want to learn more about us or contribute to the work we're doing, visit cleanercarolina.org. And I've also listed, you know, some actionable steps to take to, to think about addressing air pollution and climate change near you. And with that, I will pause. This was phenomenal. Thank you for <laughs> teaching us so much. Um, for our attendees, if you have, if you want to unmute yourselves and ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function. Um, and we're more than happy to give you audio and video access. Otherwise, feel free to put questions in the chat if you're on Zoom or if you're on Facebook, put it in the comments. And while you do that, I'm gonna pass the mic to Deja really quickly and see if she, she has any final thoughts or questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you both. Yes. <laughs> wow. Maria, you just shared so much information. And I think really for me, I think what really hit me um, hard was the fact that I didn't learn about a lot of this when I was in school, you know, and just thinking about this is some real world, you know, science and it has real world application and impacts on real communities. Um, what are some resources? Do you, do you have any resources? Are there, is there any curriculum um, for this type of information, um, for this, you know, project or if, if teachers want to introduce their students to the topic of air quality and citizen science? Um, can they get, you know, how, how do they partner with you to get <laughs> monitors for their, you know, if they want to measure the air quality at their school? I mean, it's a huge, I think that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if there are any teachers in North Carolina who would, uh, who are interested, I'd be delighted to work with them. My, my email is my name, Maria at cleanercarolina.org. Um, in general, Purple Air, I think is a great place to start. There's a number of these low cost um, monitors available to, to folks. Um, NCDEQ has a number of those um, lesson plans for teachers, for North Carolina-based teachers. And yeah, in, in general, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's not something that I thought about in school either. I had no concept of air quality monitoring up until I came into this position. So um, it's, been, it's been a world of a wealth of information and, and new findings for me too. So I'm excited to share my passion for it. And uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I'm just seeing accolades and compliments so far. Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm same in the Facebook comments. So Maria, do you have any closing thoughts for us before we go? Any call to action for the attendees? Um, keep an eye on your regulatory air quality standards around you. There's, a, you know, I've been shocked to learn about how much stuff there is going on at all times in North Carolina. And so, yeah, if you if you live in a state or in a place where you think the air quality might be suffering from any number of things, just keep an eye on it, dig in a little bit. It might, you might be surprised about what you find. 
Yeah, that is so true. Um, while you were going over the air, um, the air quality scale, I was just thinking about how I know they put the air quality scale thing on our on, on the weather app now and we can actually like see there you go what the quality of our air is like um of course i'm sure this isn't as good as having an air quality monitor in your home so of course participate in clean air carolina and of course you know get you an air quality monitor because who wouldn't want to know in real time you know what the quality of their air is and how that could potentially impact their health um so Stay informed is what I'll, that, that's going to be my, my call to action and my closing thoughts for you all. Um, Caroline, if you have any additional thoughts, please let us know. Otherwise, I'll just say thank you um, to the audience for tuning in. Thank you, Maria, for a great presentation. And I hope you all tune in next week. Passing the mic to Caroline. See you next week. Uh, thank you, Maria. And make it count this Monday, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you both so much. This was a lot of fun for me. Bye. Bye.